This is Bonjour Chai, the Truth Before Reconciliation Edition. I'm Avi Feingold in Montreal, and I'm here with Alana Zakon in Toronto. We are your frozen chosen. On today's show, we will be speaking with Deborah Korber of Korber Consulting about the Jewish community and reconciliation. But first, Alana, how are your holidays? It's all done. This is like the first time in years that I actually did something on every single night of Sukkot. I was in a sukkah. It's been a really long time. So that was nice. And I got to see a friend of mine who came in from Kitchener and uh, I got to meet her whole family, a like, really good friend of mine that used to live in Vancouver. I got to see my own relatives. I had uh, a l'chaim for my stepbrother who's getting married. So my mom came into town. So it was like a lot of family stuff, lots of good meals. Um, it was super nice. How are the rest of your... Chagim. Uh, long and exhausting. Uh, you, know. <laughs> um, you know, it's the midweek holidays are basically it means that you have holiday and Monday, which feels like a Friday because you're just preparing for the holiday. Every so day you have feels a like month a Friday. Of this like, month. Exactly. And I just, I done. And then, you know, it's just this on and on and on. And, I, and now it's Thursday again and I have to like prepare for Shabbat again tomorrow night. And uh, right. I'm ready for a full week of work next week and to <laughs> like get back to some semblance of normalcy. There is, uh, it's wonderful to have all these holidays um, and we had great weather. I must, uh, you know, accept that this was an mm-hmm. exceptionally good weather uh, year for the sukkah, for being around. Um, but uh, it's it's a bit much, and I'm ready to move on. <laughs> Fair enough. Did you see that yeah. article that came out uh, about the the plant based pork? Which one? Impo- impossible pork. Oh my pork? god! Yes, yes. <laughs> what do you what do you make of that? Oh my god! Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it yet, you should go check it out. the The people who make the Impossible Burger um, are set to have a new product called Impossible Pork that. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think that Impossible Burgers taste exactly like, you know, beef, this is going to be the mirror analog of that for pork. Um, have you tasted Impossible Burgers first before we get into that? Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, I've had like the Beyond Beyond Burger. Is, is, that's a different close brand, enough, I guess. Yeah. Close, close different enough. Different brand, but it's the same concept. Same concept. What's your take on them before we even get to that? Um, You know what? At the beginning, I was like, why would I have that? Like, I can just have kosher meat. I don't need this fake version of a burger, but I can understand why it'd be good for people who don't eat meat at all. But then I started having it. If I had a barbecue, it was just like an easy thing to have when I was with a bunch of people who didn't keep kosher. Mm -hmm. But I find that there's just so much crap. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this, but there's, there's... You can say crap. I can say crap. Actually, you've said way worse things on the show. Who am I to talk? (laughs) But there's, there's just so much like... Uh, like, uh, what are the, what's the word I'm looking for? They're unhealthy. There's like, it's, it's unhealthy. So it doesn't go down very well. Let's just say that. So I've been refraining from eating them for the last number of months because I noticed I spent a lot of time in the bathroom afterwards. Um, that's my take on, yeah. uh, the so, fake burgers. My thing from a culinary perspective is that they <laughs> getting the texture very, very close, right? If, if, you know, the, uh, Gardein or Morningstar Farms or any of these other brands of, you know, burgers... Very true. We never really they they never got the texture of mm-hmm. meat or ground beef down. Right, past, almost too so much. To but like the, the fake blood in a some of the versions, dense it's and like... stuff. But this, <laughs> it's like they really they worked hard at getting that texture and that bite yeah. of meat. It doesn't exactly true. taste like beef, but it's gotten a lot closer. And mm-hmm. I'd be curious to see what their pork product was taste like. Sadly, and this is clearly where you were going with this, um, the OU has declined to certify it as kosher, even though there's strong intimations that there's nothing unkosher in it that they would mm-hmm. readily certify it based on ingredients alone um but uh for reasons beyond that they no pun intended um that they recognize they say we have certain consumer sensibilities to adhere to um they don't want to certify a product that is called pork um mm. i have eaten and I, don't, I just don't get it i mean everybody knows that pork and bacon are like they come from pig but the flavorings and the substitutes are all over the place and there's so Mm -hmm. many of them and we have no problem with them in the jewish community whether it's you know vegan uh fake bacon bacon um, yeah or fake and bacon or whatever you want to call it or the ones that are actually meat that are basically beef fry that are smoked in and you know Mm -hmm. made in that way with or you know I've, i've seen lamb bacon from lamb belly 
you know, I, my, my favorite is because uh, one of the brands calls it uh, Facon, F-A-C-O-N, which yeah. I think is like just their, their fancy way of saying Facon, right? <laughs> like it's, it's their fancy bacon. Um, but like, oh, we all know that that's f- what it is. And it's different than actual, like it doesn't come from a pig and that there shouldn't be a reason right. for it. If we really cared about that, we shouldn't be doing bacon flavored chips that are dairy, mm-hmm. you know, for that, for that matter. Are um, they? I, I always just assume oh my I, God. Couldn't, I couldn't eat them and I just wouldn't, I wouldn't touch them. I mean, you look at them for the kosher sign and the kosher sign often <laughs> yeah. has the D attached to it. And I'm like, oh, I so never even checked. Chips that are dairy. Like, that sounds terrible Bacon flavored chips that are dairy, that are kosher and dairy are fine. <laughs> yeah, that's Because, oh, we all know that it's fake. But if this thing is called pork, but it says plant-based mm-hmm. pork, we're still not going to, to certify it. I, I, it right. boggles my mind. You know, it's, it's interesting because like I, I have to push back on this a tiny bit um, where I, I mean... People should be able to, to have access to it because it isn't meat. But I remember growing up, I would get uncomfortable around the fake bacon bits and like Caesar salads that they would put in like kosher. I love fake bacon bits. I, it made me kind of uncomfortable. Like I, I think it's just like the taste and – not the taste. I've never had real pork. But the smell of bacon I actually find like really unsettling to my system. And I don't know if that's like psychological or if it's because I never had it or because I'm Jewish, but like there is something about the smell of pig that really, really like makes me viscerally react. And so like the taste of like that little fake bacon and then maybe it didn't even taste like real bacon at all, but like I just didn't like it and I would always pick them off my salad. Uh, I I recognize that a lot of people have that. And on based on that though, do you think that the fake bacon bits shouldn't have a kosher symbol on them? No. Definitely not. I mean, I think it should be up to each individual so, person if they thing. want to have it or not. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, it really bothers me when you have this like mission creep um, mm. that kosher organizations start like, you know, stretching the the definition of what they will and will not certify as kosher. Right. Um, and like, you know, there was a restaurant in New York that had to change their name. There was a kosher restaurant called Jezebel. And the kosher certifying organization said like, oh, this is a little too much for us. And so you have to change your name to, they change it to like J Soho or something like that. I, oh, weird. Um, I just like, I don't know. It's not up to you. You're, you're not, I don't think that we should be moralizing in places where we're not being asked to moralize. Hmm. What's your um, take as a rabbi? Because I actually brought this up in conversation at my Shmini at Sarah lunch yesterday with some friends. And I was like, what, what do you all think about this? And then one person was like, oh, I thought that we weren't technically allowed to replace foods that we can't actually eat because then like halakhically it might be like, it might tempt us to eat more. But then the other person was like, no, it would actually tempt us to eat less because then you have an alternative. Like, what do, what do you think as a rabbi? So, so this, this is not a new argument, right? This, always, this goes all the way back to the Talmud. Right. And the Talmud has these discussions of like, what should one do if one has a craving for this unkosher food or that unkosher food? And it, they go and say, well, you should eat. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think for pork, they were like, you should eat the oh, yeah, innards of X fish or something like that. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and I, I, I'm trying to remember what the animal or what the product was. Yeah. But they, the Talmud is very explicit that says, you know, if you have a craving, you can fulfill it with a, a kosher thing that tastes just Similar. like that and, you know, in, and enjoy it. Um, because the thing that is being forbidden is not the taste of x or the idea of x it's, it's the, the actual food. product itself yeah, yeah right we shouldn't be we shouldn't be allowing if we really cared about that we shouldn't be allowing to have non-dairy creamer hmm. right to go and say well you're allowed to have non-dairy creamer after your mm. meat meal with your coffee because that's just not kosher right it's mm. n- there's no difference to me and yet we do that all the time we make yeah. fake shrimp all the time yeah that the, is very true I, it's a we make very it in the prevalent freaking and... shape of shrimp yeah right no, it's not true. like it's not like we're even <laughs> pretending yeah, no. Right, and, you, and we, and yet, Jews because we are shrimp. so pretending, yeah, right. Mm. Like, so why is that allowed? But mm. ground beef, ground meat that is designed to taste like pork, right, is not allowed because it's called pork. Like, it just mm. boggles my mind, and I have no problem with it. I'd be the first person to certify it if they, you know, came yeah. to me. If you guys are listening and you want us to sponsor the program, I will certify your, uh, you know, impossible pork, and uh, it'll be the official fake pork product of. Uh, Bonjour, hi. Um, anyways, I just, I really have no problem with it. I think that people that mm. do, um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, if you have a problem with the bacon bits, then yeah. uh, I don't even I don't know, know if I would I eat the fake. Like... I was just trying to imagine like eating the fake pork. And like, I actually feel like a part of me would think that it was real and like not want to touch it. Like it maybe would take me time to actually try it, even though it's fake. But yeah, I don't know. That's where I'm at. But it could be certified. I think it should be. Eh. Could be and should be. Um, Yeah. Anyways, before we get to our main topic, let us hear from our sponsor. 
Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Atelier Lou Bijouterie in Montreal, Quebec. Atelier Lou specializes in watches and custom designed jewelry along with a curated selection of designer jewelry. Visit them online or in person and Eric Goldberg will help make your jewelry dreams come true. Atelier Lou is offering a promo code for all Bonjour High listeners using BON18 at checkout for 10% off your order at atelierlou.com. And uh, the, the Atelier Lou gifts do keep rolling in for the bat mitzvah, but uh, we can talk more about those another time. Um, really, uh, Eric's, Eric's great. I, um, we, we should talk more about the pieces that he has available, but uh, for now, on to our next topic. <laughs> Today marks the first in what many hope will become an annual day of truth and reconciliation for Canadians uh, to reckon with the tragedy that happened and is still happening on a daily basis with our First Nations. The Jewish community should be at the forefront of this incredibly important discussion, and yet we don't often rise to the challenge. Um, With us to discuss uh, what is and isn't happening is Deborah Korber, the founder of Korber Consulting, which works to assist a wide variety of organizations towards reconciliation. Previously, Ms. Korber has also served as CEO of Federation CJA in Montreal and is unique in that she has a deep understanding of both the Jewish community and having worked on Indigenous rights for over 25 years, knows a thing or two about our First Nations as well. Deborah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Abby. Hi, Alana. Hi, thanks for coming on. So uh, I want to start with um, sort of a high-level question. What What is happening in terms of reconciliation uh, vis-a-vis the Jewish community and, and the indigenous communities that people might not know about because they're happening really at a high level and we're not seeing it at the, you know, street view? Well, you know, I, I don't have... Um, uh Sort of a list of all the things that are that are going on. Um, I, I am, I, I am yeah. aware, um, certainly, that individual Jewish federations are doing a whole wide range of programming. For example, I I signed out a blog um, last night um, on Honor the Day called Truth Before Reconciliation, and one of the people I sent it to is Andrea Friedman, who's the CEO of um, the Jewish Federation of Ottawa. Uh, and who is who is a, a friend um, of mine from Federation days? And um, she wrote back immediately and said, "We have a program this morning at uh, at nine o'clock with Bob Watts, who's a really um, highly experienced uh, Indigenous advocate and leader. And they're they're calling their program National Truth and Reconciliation Day: Symbolic Gesture." Or systemic change, which I thought mm. was just such a um, a great a great title. And she she mentioned in the note to me that they were going to do it originally just for staff, and in the end decided just to open it up to the broader Jewish community, which I thought was really um, fantastic. Yeah, that's right. Um, Temple Emmanuel here in Montreal, I know, has a working group on truth and reconciliation. They are developing um, a land acknowledgement that they can use in their programs. Um, and looking at a wide range of educational initiatives. Shara Shemayam, where I am a member, I'm not aware, Avi, you would have a much better idea than I do of programming, but I know I've been invited on a number of occasions over the years, I would say over the past 10 to 15 years, um, to, uh, to to speak on um, reconciliation and, and, and Indigenous rights. I, I know that somebody will be giving a sermon about it. Oh, well, Shemayam. that's wonderful. That's fantastic. I, I actually did... Um, I, I wouldn't call it a Devar Torah, but I did a little um, talk on it. I've lost track of time, but maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, and, and I did it on residential schools and it was uh, in the third or third parallel service at Shara Shemayan. It was on, it was on Yom Kippur. Uh, and I talked a lot about atonement um, because obviously there was a, a, a very a clear connection there. So, you know, there's certainly a lot of interest I know um, the other federations in Canada are doing programming and having panels, etc. CJA, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, um, has been very, um, very interested in, engaged on uh, issues of Indigenous rights. CJA, of course, is our is our national advocacy organization, and of course, they come at these things from um, not just a moral perspective but a strategic perspective and they're all about they're all about um, as they need to be making common cause with a wide range of groups in society and communities in society 
on issues that pursue justice and that fight against discrimination um, of, all, of all kinds. So I know there are many high level contacts that they have with leadership across the indigenous world in, um, in Canada. And they, they advocate on behalf of issues when, when it fits right. the paradigm. I had a chance to read your blog last night. Uh, it's super well written. Listeners, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, we can drop a link. And I was wondering if you could just share a bit about what you spoke about in regards to truth in the, it's called truth and reconciliation. And you kind of elaborate on why the truth part is now part of your vocabulary. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, you know, for, for a while, I've been kind of using this hashtag of reconciliation is not just for governments. The, um, the reality is that the heavy lifting in reconciliation is, of course, for governments. Uh, governments uh, are the inheritors of the original colonialists. Governors, uh, governments control the purse. Uh, governments have the levers to effect change on a broad uh, way, in a systemic way. Um, but but there are roles for all of us to play, and at the end of the day, um, governments only do what their voters expect them to do. Um, so I've been using this hashtag, uh, reconciliation is not just for governments, um, and when these gruesome discoveries um, happened of, of um, the remains of children on the site to former residential schools, and people were just... Uh, horrified and indignant and how come we never knew about this and I was really for days wandering around the house really kind of in a you don't know I was irritable and I, I just kept saying to my husband where have people been living under a rock uh, because we should have known and because we've been mm-hmm. told about this for a long 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 time so it got me really thinking about why don't we know um, and uh, thinking that there's a reason that the phrase is truth and reconciliation. And, and it's not just that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada that was mandated to um, to really dig up everything about the truth of residential schools. But there are Truth and Reconciliation Commissions all across the world. There was one after the horrible reign of Pinochet in Chile. Um, There have been in South Africa, in in many parts of the world that have known um, genocides and discrimination on a systemic level. And, you know, it's very easy to talk about reconciliation. I think a lot of indigenous people are beginning to feel that it's a a word um, that's bandied about a lot but without a lot of meaning or action behind it. Um, And it just got me thinking that really truth comes before reconciliation. Reconciliation Mm. is is, is not about sitting around a campfire and singing Kumbaya, you know, like we did some shit and we know better now and let's just all be friends. It's it's really not. Right. So it's like acknowledging first. Well, you have to understand first, right? So so understanding... Right. I wrote a blog a number of years ago, and I actually said um, that there really are, um, there are are sort of three components to how we come at reconciliation. First, you have to know your history. Right. And and I don't know about you, Alana, I think you're the same age as as my daughter, which is around 28 somewhere. Um, I'm exactly 28. and, And I don't know what you learned in school. She didn't learn a lot. Yeah, it was not great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, learned learned I learned a lot more. I learned a lot more when I I lived in BC for the last five years, and that's where I got my Indigenous education. And I had a very similar reaction to you when I I saw how people were reacting to the to the residential school incident that happened recently because I, everyone was talking about it where right. I was. So I feel you. Well, well, BC, BC of course is home to the greatest number of First Nations in Canada. There's two hundred and some odd yeah. in BC alone out of six hundred so. Yeah. Um, there, many of them are very, very tiny. Um, so the biggest communities don't live in BC. They're, they're elsewhere in the country. Um, but there are many and um, issues around indigenous rights and residential schools are much more, I think, front of mind um, in BC than they are in other parts of the country. Um, so first of all, you know, knowing, knowing the history, um, and, and that means knowing the truth. The truth, what, what, what happened? And then understanding the implications for today, and finally you move on to action. You know, we should be at the forefront of this. You know, as a community that is 
so caring about our truth of what happened in the past hundred years, right? As people who, you know, look for Holocaust deniers and root them out and say, you are wrong. We are here to tell you the truth. We look at people like Deborah Lipsat as heroes of ours. And yet we are not doing this in the Jewish community. We, I, I did an informal survey of schools in Montreal, right? Just by asking around, I know a lot of parents, only about half the schools in Montreal are doing Orange Shirt Day today or doing a program in school um, to talk about it. Um, the Montreal Holocaust Museum hasn't had a single post about this on any of their social medias in the past month or so. Um, we should be the ones saying we care about truth, we care about genocides and showing that it's not just about us. Never again doesn't mean just never again for us, but never again for the world to have genocides. And yet here's a genocide and we're not always at the forefront. So should we be doing better? And what what are the things that we should be like looking towards to say, hey, we can be doing better as a community? Well, yes, we should be doing better. I think all non-Indigenous Canadians should be and need to be need to be doing better. But you're you're yeah. right, Abby. I mean, certainly we have a natural um, affinity with um, not just uh, searching out and revealing and holding people accountable for the truth, um, but for anything to do with justice. I mean, you know, tzedek tzedek tiered off. I mean, this is at the core of what it means to be to be Jewish. Um, and Jews have been at the forefront, certainly in modern times, of virtually every civil rights battle um, and anti-discrimination fight that has that has taken place. And, and I must say that in the area of fighting for Indigenous rights, that's true as well. I have found there to be a, a disproportionate, in terms of our percentage of the population, number of Jews who are um, advocates for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples across the country. So that that is um, that is still the case. But organizationally, but there's a distinction organizationally, yeah, I was going to say the distinction been. to be made between Jews being at the yes. forefront and it being yeah. at forefront of the Jewish community. Having worked for an organization like CJ, what, what would you say are the barriers that exist from bringing more of that into big Jewish organizations when you're also trying to advocate for Jewish rights and bringing up Jewish issues? It's like how much is there is there space? Is that the problem? Like, what, why do you think that there's there's been those barriers, or are they there? Maybe uh, they don't I need think- to be there. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know that there are barriers so much as there are issues of, of mandate. Um, and, and when you're talking about um, fundraising organizations that have a particular mandate, which is um, most importantly to go and raise funds, to be able to support the community, whether it's supporting the most vulnerable in the community, whether it's supporting education and looking towards the future. Um, and they're accountable to donors. And, you know, donors all have different views on um, how the dollars should be allocated. So um, getting engaged in issues that, strictly speaking, go beyond the mandate of raising funds for the Jewish community uh, um, is is a little bit fraught. It doesn't mean that it can't be done Mm -hmm. and it won't ever be done. Obviously, it's being done in some federations today, Um, but it's certainly not at the Front, uh, the forefront of of, um, of federations' minds. But but having said that, federations, of course, although they play a very central role in our community, they are not the only Jewish organizations that exist. Um, I think it's much easier, uh, and the evidence shows that that it has um, unfolded this way for synagogues and temples to to step up and get involved in programming because they play um, a different kind of role in educating the community, mm-hmm. in, in raising awareness. Um, some are more activist than others, mm-hmm. but they certainly are, um, are conveners of um, members of, of the community to talk about issues of concern mm-hmm. and I think are more naturally placed to make common cause in a way that has no, um, there's no quid pro quo, right? So it, it, it's not like making common cause because if I scratch my book, your back, you'll scratch mine. It, it, it's just for the sole purpose of really promoting mm-hmm. Jewish values. Right. So, in, And justice is a key Jewish value. In, in your perfect vision of Jewish community supporting Indigenous issues, what would that look like? It would look first and foremost to me um, like a, a community that is educating itself and insisting on its children being educated. Jewish communities don't control the education system writ large, but they have a fair degree to say about 
how Jewish schools are yeah. educating their kids. A number of years ago, um, I don't, maybe two or three years ago, the Siegel Center in Montreal um, put on a fabulous performance. You may have seen it, Alana. It was in Vancouver. I think it was originally yeah. a Vancouver co-production. I know the people who ran... We talked about this with Nakuset on, okay, on our last so episode. Ch- well, Nakuset issues. was there. That play, like... Yeah. Chil- Children yeah, of God. that play is amazing. And, and it, you know, yeah. when you think about it, um, residential schools is not a natural narrative for a musical, perhaps. Um, but it really is is a brilliant show. And uh, Lisa Rubin, the executive director of the Siegel Center, um, was visionary enough to bring this to Montreal. And and I, I know through conversation with her um, that she reached out to the Jewish day schools. Um, and I think there were a couple of them that were brought in for special performances and discussion with the performers who were all Indigenous. But they weren't all mm-hmm. interested in participating. And I don't remember which were. It doesn't doesn't really matter. This isn't mm-hmm. about naming. Um but in, in my, you know, per- perfect world um, of sort, sort of Jewish community intersection with Indigenous rights and Indigenous issues, I would say that we do, we do um, have a measure of control over our schools and our schools are teaching our, um, our future community members and future leaders. And if, if they integrate this kind of programming, uh, you know, we're not taking over the mandate of Jewish schools, which is, you know, Jewish and secular education. But if they make this something that's important, then I think that would be something that we are doing for the future of our community and the future of justice for Indigenous peoples in a small way. So if I find you the right team of educators, will La Corber Consulting help create a curriculum for Jewish schools to do a unit or two on how these are Jewish issues as well as Indigenous issues? You know, I've, I've, I've been asked about that. And the truth is, I'm, I'm very reticent to, um, to well, maybe corporate consulting will find the find people the right exactly. On the other I'm side. very, yes. I'm very mm-hmm. reticent um, to to speak on these issues publicly for two reasons. One, pr- practically speaking, um, all of my work these days is for the government of Canada, um, and so I'm not, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not a crusader. Um, I am in my own gadfly sort of way, um, trying to pursue justice and reconciliation on the government side, where the heavy lifting has to be done. But I need to obviously be cautious about uh, about what what I say and, and where. But the more mm. important reason is because um, I don't think it's right for non-Indigenous people to be speaking for Indigenous peoples. Um, there, I, I I will help them make. Yeah, no, no. Listen, Abby, you, you're we're we're on the same we're on the same page on this. There are first of all there are. Um, Jewish advocates for Indigenous peoples who could be a great bridge to finding the Indigenous spokespeople and advocates to mm-hmm. help construct these curricula. So it's it's not it's not a hard shit up to make. Yeah, I know many in Vancouver who work in in that specific area, and they told me that there's a lot of Jews, a lot of young Jews around my age who specifically work direct uh, with the Indigenous community. So there's certainly people out there. I was curious in your work that you've done. What do you feel is the biggest gap in people's knowledge, not necessarily in the Jewish community, but the community at large that is non-Indigenous? Like, where do you think, uh, like, which part of history is the part that's most overlooked? Or is it just denial in general that that you have to face um, when dealing with people who haven't really uh, come to terms with what happened? I think the biggest problem is ignorance. I think people just don't know. Um, I, I think it's sad but true that sometimes horrible things have to be made very real and concrete before people pay attention. So the revelation of these unmarked um, graves and, and remains of children uh, really, really rattled people um, better late than never, Alana. The question is, how long will we continue to pay attention? We have yeah. short attention span. It's, it's, it's a paradox that we... We live in an age of unparalleled access to information, and yet our attention spans are short, um, mm-hmm. and and we we don't we don't stick with something. So it's ignorance, I would say. I actually think that that's actually one of the things that, as the Jewish community, we are experts at, and we should be lending our voice towards. And you know, we know how to take something which is older history, and create things like March of the Living, and create museums and memorials and annual moments where people know that this is not going away, that the, the ideas are not going away. And and we should be leaders in helping 
other communities think about this in terms of, you know, I, I, I'm struck by the, um, I don't know if you ever read the book, uh, The Jew and the Lotus. Um, it no. was, uh, so the book came out about 25, 30 years ago, somewhere around there, where the Dalai Lama had collected a group of um, Jewish scholars from a, across the spectrum, whether academics or spiritual scholars. Um, and he gathered them and he said, listen, we are a people in exile. Um, you have been a people in exile for thousands of years and you seem to be making it work. What can we learn from you? Um, and, and we are very good at taking a genocide and keeping it at the forefront of our minds and of the world communal minds. Um, and we should be lending our expertise in that way to say this is just because the residential school graves were dug up this year doesn't mean that we have to let it go and let that information peter away after a year or two mm-hmm. or three. That's an excellent point. Um, I, I think sort of uh, more broadly about the um, the affinities, the natural affinities that we have, uh, having lived the most horrific uh, genocide in re- recorded history. Um, there, there are many differences, of course, but there are certainly um, parallels. But I hadn't really thought about it the way you put it, Avi, is knowing how to um, keep a genocide and, and, and the truths and the accountability for that genocide at the forefront over time. Mm-hmm that that is something that we have unique expertise in. And we, we should think further, I will certainly think further after this uh, this conversation about how we might be able to connect on that. Um, I, I am aware that there have been not only expressions of interest from certain indigenous uh, communities, but actually some programming that takes certain communities to Israel. One of the things that some indigenous communities have been very interested in is how the Jewish people in Israel managed to take uh, an ancient language and a language of prayer and turn it into um, a modern language that is uh, really thriving, Be- right? Live a living, breathing, thriving language. Uh, and, and as living, they, yeah. they're, they're 60 somewhat indigenous language, mm-hmm. many of them um, at risk of, of, um, of, of disappearing completely. There is federal legislation now, thankfully, a few years old that, that seeks to support um, really regenerating these languages and, and, and keeping them alive and teaching them, etc. But there is that affinity, at least on the language front. How did you do that? Um, there are some um, schools across the country, immersion schools that are emerging. Certainly, I know there are Mohawk ones closer, closer to us here in Montreal that have had enormous, enormous success in, in really teaching young kids who are now fluent where their parents and grandparents yeah. even may have lost the language and are now fluent speakers of their their native yeah. language so there is that but on genocide you're right there is there is a particular um expertise that we have sadly that we could be sharing yeah. going back to what you just said about the various languages and cultures that's something that i learned um when i was living in vancouver i attended an event uh that was organized through my friend's organization Macomb. Uh, that brought in an indigenous woman who actually has like some Jewish lineage. I don't remember if it was her father, grandfather, but it was pretty close. And she taught me something and I, maybe you can help me remember the term, but it was a word that was basically describing trying to kind of show that you have indigenous support, but the information is not accurate to the right tribe. Like they have, let's say, um, totem poles, that are uh, up in Vancouver, but the tribe that actually was from that specific area would not have those type of totem poles. So it's kind of like people saying, look, we're trying to make this more indigenous to bring your culture, but it's not the right culture. And there was a term that she um, used to explain what, what that was. And I'm, I'm not remembering it. I don't know if you know. I, I, you're not talking about cultural appropriation. Well, it is cultural appropriation, but there was like a specific like indigenous term for it. Anyway, I'll look it up later. And I no, I... I, I don't know what the indigenous term for it yeah. is, but, but you know, you're, you're raising, I think, um, a related point, which is, you know, when people say, what, what would you like people to know um, about indigenous peoples in Canada? And I mean, there are so many things I would like them to know, but to your point, indigenous peoples are not a monolith. Exactly. Um, in, in, indigenous peoples um, are nations with their own languages, their own cultures, and their own um, distinct histories, Mm -hmm. they have much in common. There are common values across all indigenous peoples. Um, Reverence for the environment being um, a a core shared value. 
Um, another that really resonates with me that I wish people knew was that indigenous peoples, perhaps not all, you know, I'm not, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not an anthropologist, so I, I don't claim to have expertise in, in indigenous culture, but what I have picked up over the years is that certainly there are a number of indigenous nations um, that um, are in their decision making always looking forward to the next seven generations. Hmm. And that notion of the decisions we make today are not just about us or our children or grandchildren, but will have implications for the next seven generations. Um, and so I, I think about that a lot because I think um, as our attention spans get shorter and shorter and as environmental issues in the world get more and more grave, um, we, we are at risk because, because we don't seem to be able to think further than our, our, our nose. And that's something that uh, Indigenous peoples do a whole lot better than we do. I also, I, I also want people to know that Indigenous peoples, you know, while we're talking about truth and reconciliation and the painful uh, legacy of residential schools, that there's so much positive mm. going on in Indigenous communities across the country. There is incredible resilience. There is unbelievable creativity and innovation and um, economic growth and thriving. And um, on the cultural front, th th this is, you know, a, 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 um, such an incredible area for people to explore. There's indigenous contribution to this country. We, we tend to think of indigenous so peoples as the ones that we, we have to compensate, and we do. Um, but but as people who are just victims or people um, mm. that, that we need to care for. And in fact, that's not true. We have to do justice. Uh, we have to share resources in this country and we have to share power in this country and allocate it more fairly and differently. And that's hard for mm -hmm. people to do. Um, but we also have to embrace the contributions. We have to be open to what we can learn from Indigenous peoples, not just what we can do for them or with them, what we can learn from them what the richness that they are contributing to the country. 100%. I have a question uh, for you, lots, but lots to learn. before I yeah. forget it, I just realized that my friend's organization is Hamakum. I've been in Toronto for three weeks and I'm already blending organizations. But um, my question for you is um, what led you to working in this particular area? Do you remember what the moment was where you decided you wanted to work in indigenous issues? It, it really wasn't that, um, it wasn't one of those eureka moments. I'm sorry to disappoint. Um, I kind of fell into it. Um, what I knew after going to law school in Toronto and, and articling in a private firm, corporate commercial litigation, all that jazz, um, was that really um, my, my, my deepest interest was in human rights at large. So I did graduate work in human rights and then I need to get a job. And um, I, I wanted to work in anything related to constitutional law or human rights. And honestly, the first position that was offered to me in the Department of Justice was in working in indigenous issues and rights. Um, and uh, it was actually a Jewish boy from Montreal who had moved to Ottawa, who was running this unit, a fellow by the name of Martin Freeman, who became a friend and a mentor. Um, and that was in 1988. And it was, it was really interesting to me because um, I, I call myself a charter baby. So I was in law school when the Constitution was patriated in 1982 and Canada got its first uh, constitutionally entrenched Bill of Rights, the Charter of Rights. Uh, and at the time, you know, as a 22 year old, I was much more interested in sexy things like freedom of expression and religion and, uh, and indigenous rights, Aboriginal and treaty rights, which were um, now the entrenched and constitutionally protected and recognized were not really um, a major concern for me, even though I was studying with Brian Slattery, who was one of the, um, the leading uh, academics in the field at the time, and I had no idea. Uh, but when, years later, this position was offered to me, um, I jumped at it, because obviously Aboriginal rights are human rights, and I thought, oh, well, this is kind of a subset, and I fell in love with the field, um, I fell in love really with um, the Indigenous people that I got a chance to to work with, often sitting across the table um, negotiating, um, but who opened up my eyes and um, and got me to see a little bit more of the truth because I'm learning every single day. Um, and uh, there was no looking back from there. So 
I know that you you speak about this a bit on your website, um, but if maybe you can elaborate for us, especially on a day like today, um, what are some of the things that uh, individuals can be doing um, to both further that idea of truth, meaning how can we learn, what are the concrete things that we can do to learn, um, but also what are the things that we can do, um, whether as individuals or as individuals within the Jewish community, to really, you know, to activate, if we want to be activists, if we want to just go that one step beyond and say, great, today my kid wore an orange shirt, I want to do something real, um, but I want it to last beyond September 30th. I want this to, to, to go further. That's a great question. It's an important question. And as luck would have it, um, in my research for this um, blog, this latest blog that I did, I found uh, something that says, uh, it's just, it's kind of a graphic, what can you do um, that was put out by the Assembly of, uh, of Nova Scotia and Mi'kmaq Chiefs. I can share it with you afterwards. It's actually a, a link um, in the, uh, the bottom we'll of my blog. We'll put a link up to that on our yeah, show it's, notes. It's at the bottom yeah. of my blog. Uh, supporting residential school survivors and Indigenous peoples, what can you do? And there are a whole range of things that you can do. Um, hosting an orange shirt day or wearing an orange shirt, I, I, I don't want to minimize that. I know these kinds of things can sometimes feel performative, um, on the other hand, symbolism is important too. And if nothing else, it shows support, it shows respect, it shows awareness, and it can start a conversation with somebody else. So it's it's an important thing, but but obviously, you know, it, it it's well, symbolic and it's not as, enough. As Jews, we really know the power of ritual. We, abs- right? we so absolutely we do. We shake lulavs and we often forget why. <laughs> but we do it. So true, so true. Okay, so um, I'm just going to... Uh, point out a few of these things. There, there are many suggestions on this, uh, on this page. So we can hear the stories of survivors. There, uh, there are many programs to watch. We Were Children, Read Out of the Depths by Isabel Knockwood. I mean, you can have a whole reading list of things that people could do. We can do what we do so well, which is philanthropy. Um, it's not something we think about very often but we can donate to organizations and support counseling and other supports for survivors. Uh, There's the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line, there's the Legacy of Hope Foundation, there's the Orange Shirt Society, and there are many others. So we can give with our dollars, not at the expense of other things that we support, but in addition to. We can support indigenous artists. This is really very dear to my heart because I have a background in music before I went to law school. Artists, drummers, singers, dancers, language learners, and even small business owners. Um, They're all helping communities to heal. Um, We can do something, Abby, we touched on this earlier. We can seek out Indigenous advocates and give them a a voice. When we're um, organizing programming, by all means, use Mm -hmm. people like me to help connect to Indigenous speakers who can who can come and share their, um, th- their perspectives. It's, re- it's really important to have authentic voices, but that's not a substitute for doing the work. And just like you hear people speak um, in the context of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement about the exhaustion that black people are feeling, indigenous people are feeling the same thing of having to sort of, oh, here we go again. I have to sensitize you. I have to educate you. Um, we have to do the work. We have to read, we have to learn. There are films mm-hmm. to watch. There are so many um, different media that we can consume in order just to learn. Uh, but we also need to hear directly from indigenous um, people. There are courses there, are, I think they call them MOOCs, that are these open online courses that people can take. I know UBC has an open online course called, well, I don't know what it's called, but it's in Indigenous Studies and Reconciliation. And these courses are free. I think the University of Alberta has one. So educating ourselves is not a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, The Truth and Reconciliation Commission put out um, an immense and powerful report in uh, 2016. You can go on the TRC website and find that. It's volumes, right? This is a lot to ask um, people to read. Um, but there is an executive summary and it really kind of gives you an overview of things. And I have a book that I really, I, I have to get more of them because I usually stockpile them and give them away for gifts. It is a thin volume. It is a must read and it's called 21 things you may not know about the Indian act by Bob Joseph. 
you could read it in a sitting, in an mm. afternoon, in an evening. I mean, it's, wow. it's hard to digest because it really smacks you up the side of the head. Um, but if, if you really want to get a sense of um, how uh, profoundly colonialism has affected Indigenous peoples, in Canada at least, this book will explain an awful lot and you will never think about Indigenous issues or reconciliation the same way again. 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act. If people do nothing else, they should they should read that. Then there's, I mean, there's advocacy things, calling on senators to, you know, to support certain bills and initiatives, etc. But by all means, if you put the link to the blog, people will see this graphic at the end. Um, and, you know, for example, if you love culture, think about what matters to you, what, what you're passionate about. CBC I was today. Gonna ask you. CBC today from 6 a.m. this morning until midnight are playing indigenous music all day. You, you understate vastly your background in music. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'm going to point it out to people. <laughs> she is a wonderful, accomplished musician. Um, what is your playlist? Give us your top few uh, artists that we should be listening to. I can't. I can give it to you. I can give it to you another time. I wasn't prepared for the question, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do my homework. I mean, I grew, I grew up listening to Redbone. I grew up listening to Redbone, which was, okay. you know, when I mean, love putting people on the spot back in the seventies. And, and I still, I still love their, uh, I, I still love their music. I could certainly come up with a playlist for you. Um, th- there's, um, one of my favorite artists, by the way, because I have the opportunity just to highlight her, um, is Susan Aglukark. Susan Aglukark is an Inuit, um, singer. I'm not sure what she's put out, um, these days. Um, but she had a couple of recordings back in the 90s that were beyond wonderful. Um, and there, there are just so many artists all across the country and great, great innovation um, that is happening and collaborations. As the play Children of God was a, co- was a co-production um, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous mm-hmm. artists. Yeah. You had been talking about uh, making native languages into living languages. And one of the things that I find remarkable in, a, in an amazing and positive, beautiful way is the rise of uh, First Nations hip hop and rap music that's coming out of uh oh yeah there's so much uh, you know the young communities which is really showing that this is living right there are more native first nation rappers than there are yiddish rappers right now and we like to think of yiddish as this really amazing living language that's huge and have a big renaissance and uh, you know that that that's not happening nearly as much but uh yeah so that's that any, any final thoughts, anything that you want to uh, leave us with? You know, a number of years ago, when I started working um, at Federation, I reached out to Rabbi Shire at the Shire, and I said, I'm, I'm not very Jewishly literate, um, and I really feel like I, I need to be a tiny bit more literate. And so uh, we spent some time, Rabbi Shire and I, every week, um, me learning from him, and we read Pirkei Avot together, Ethics of the Fathers. And one, one, of the, um, one of the teachings from Pirkei Avot that we, we all cite very often as Jews, but which I take very much to heart, is that we're, we're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are we free to desist from it. Hmm. Um, colonialism is not unique to Canada. It's not unique to the United States. Um, the Europeans colonized and, and, and other civilizations have colonized throughout human history. Um, but I focus on Canada. The effects of colonialism um, are, are profound and they are pernicious. And the way out of this is complicated and hard. It's really hard. Um, and it's going to take a long, long time. So while we're not obligated to complete the work, I think we all need to be um, participants in this pursuit of, uh, of justice going forward. And we can start with baby steps. Not everybody's going to become a lawyer or advocate in these areas. And, and that's not what anybody is suggesting. But we all need to be better informed and pay attention. Because at the end of the day, governments only act in one of three circumstances. They act um, when the courts force them to act. They act when uh, there's a crisis of some sort. You know, there's a, there's idle no more, there's a fight over a pipeline, a bridge is barricaded and they have to step in. But they act when voters expect them to act. And if we are informed and we pay attention, 
if we open our minds and our hearts and we care about doing what is right, then we will hold our leaders to account for doing what's right. And I hope that's what we all begin to do. And I hope that the Jewish community takes uh, more of a leadership role in, in whatever forms. Avi, you and Elena had some great ideas today, and I'd be happy to talk further with you about them offline. Sounds like a plan. Excellent. Deborah Korber, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you both. Let's move on to our nachas. When we look at what's uh, giving us nachas uh, in the past week, Alana, what's been giving you nachas? Uh, so I got to actually meet some of the people that we work with here at the CJN, and that was really exciting for me. Um, we had a little outdoor sukkah party, um, and I got to meet uh, Yoni, who runs the CJN, and I got to meet a whole bunch of other people. It was like maybe five of us total, making it sound like it was like an army. But um, it was really nice, and it was so funny because when I sat down, um, one of the writers, Lila, was like, oh my god, you're Ilana. I didn't know what you looked like, but I've been listening to your voice for months, and I've never put a face to it. So that was kind of a funny experience to actually interact with people who knew all about me, but I'd never really met before. And I got to meet Ellen, and we chatted, and... It was very cool and it reminded me of how uh, when we met briefly, though I feel like because we have videos on uh, Riverside where we're recording our podcast, it wasn't as intense because I'd already, yeah. I knew what you yeah. looked like, you know, I didn't know how tall you were as we talked about with Melissa yeah. that one time, but yeah, yeah, that's nice. really cool. I got a couple copies of the magazine. Yeah, the magazine is really nice. If you haven't gotten one, um, check it out so nice Um, there's a lot of good content in that magazine and it'll be quarterly for the subscribers of the circle um and i'm sure as the months progress we will tell you more and more about the circle um but you should join the cjn circle you should be supporting the cjn all of you if you like what we're doing here on the uh uh on bonjour chai and being part of the cjn podcast network um we should be opening up and you should be uh recognizing that although we are a lean mean journalism writing machine and reporting machine we should all be uh (laughs) Yes, absolutely. You should uh, put your put your money where is, your ears honestly, are. Honestly, it is a really nice it. magazine. Yeah, yeah no, it, it is actually really nice. So my nachas. Well, I have little What's your nachas, nachas this week. Um, my we we finally we my daughter had her bat mitzvah oh. this week. It was quite the uh, moment. It was a beautiful Saturday morning. It was a Friday morning. She did let a service for women. Uh, Shabbat morning. Uh, she she read Kohelet. Uh, she read from the book of Ecclesiastes. She gave a she gave a Dvar Torah. Uh, my wife gave a Dvar Torah and addressed her. I spoke. My daughter, my other daughters led the end of the service. Did Don Olam and Anim Zmirot. Um, lots of beautiful fun. Uh, family came in uh, less than we hoped for because of covid and testing it's ridiculous you can't you like you know mm-hmm. you, you have to test to it's come across the country and like because of the holidays they had to test in time and not in time and a brother-in-law's flight got canceled but whatever it was fine it was beautiful it was a really really special moment uh we she made us in in immensely proud um and uh I, as i told everybody that told me that wished me mazel tov, uh she worked 12 years for this and it showed and uh so so that was my real special serious literal nachas of the week nachas. and then after this you will not hear about the bat mitzvah ad infinitum um again for a while until it actually has a relevant portion to to pop up with anyways thank you for listening to bonjour chai for thursday september 30th our producer is michael freeman technical production is by andre goulet and our music is by so called we are a project of the jewish living lab and are distributed by the cjn podcast network you can listen to all our past episodes on our new page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on apple spotify or wherever you get your podcasts please leave a comment and a rating on the platform of your choice i'm avi feingold and i'm ilana zakon 